As you've probably already noticed, I am not John Frawley. So just, if, if this is your first time in person, that's not me. My name is Caleb Rowland, and uh, my wife Hayden and I, we've lived here in Oklahoma City for uh, about a year now. We've been a part of Metropolitan, and we love this church. Uh, John is taking a couple of weeks of much-deserved vacation. They're at a family camp right now, headed to Pine Cove to um, enjoy some time together and a time away. So be praying for them just to have a great time of rest and refreshing here over the next couple of weeks. So uh, that's more than enough about me, ready to jump into the Word of God. So uh, we've been in the book of Ecclesiastes, and uh, today we come to Ecclesiastes chapter 3. And before we jump into the verses, um, I want to show you this Bible. So this Bible looks probably like a lot of Bibles that you've seen, uh, pretty, you know, kind of inconspicuous. It's just got a black leather cover on it, but this Bible is actually extremely special. Uh, whenever you open up the first page of this Bible to the dedication page, um, it says, from Morris, October 25th, 1973. Now, that might not mean a lot to anybody. But uh, this Bible was actually given to my grandfather by a name, by a guy named Morris, and I really don't know a lot about him. I think he was a cop, and I think his name was Morris. That's what I know about this guy named Morris, uh, that he gave my grandfather this Bible. My grandfather was, um, he would, would have called himself a spiritualist at the time. He actually was attending a church, he was teaching a Sunday school, and whenever the kids would ask him, hey, so what happens whenever you die? He would tell them, well, you're reincarnated. Right? You, you come back as something else, and you kind of just complete this cycle over and over again. So he, he did not know Christ, uh, but thought himself very spiritual. My grandfather uh, was a very intelligent man, and so constantly people would come to him to, to argue, to debate, and um, just nothing ever changed his mind. So um, he met this man named Morris through um, his then wife, and as uh, he went to meet him, um, he heard that he was a Christian, so he wanted to, you know, jump into some debates. He wanted to get ready, so he, you know, got out all of his ammunition. He was ready to go, and Morris just handed him this Bible, and he said, here you go. You won't understand what I'm talking about until you read this. And he left it at that. He wouldn't argue. He wouldn't start a debate. He just handed him the Bible, and my grandfather was intrigued. And so he began to read the Bible. He began to read it occasionally, so that he could break down arguments. He began to, to get in there to figure out how he could debate, and then he started reading it daily, and then he started to believe it, and then he gave his life to Christ. And now if you look inside this Bible, uh, at the first page, as you open it up, has the Romans Road. It says Romans 3.23, 6.23, 5.10, and 10.13, and throughout you'll find many notes that he's written over the years because of that one small act. So as we come into Ecclesiastes, um, chapter 3, we, the book of Ecclesiastes, you might have noticed, and we've kind of joked a little bit, that it's a little dark. Anybody notice that? Right? Maybe, a little, maybe you haven't noticed that. Maybe you're like, oh, this is great. I love it. But it's, it's a little bit dark. We, we see kind of the real, um, the real torment that Solomon is going through and trying to find the meaning of life apart from God. And I think the reason that Ecclesiastes is such an interesting book in general is because we can relate with it. Uh, John, I didn't ever hear his, uh, I haven't met him before, had never heard his story or his testimony. He got up and, right? We, uh, we connected with that story because most of us have been there. We have faced tragedies. We faced times where it seems like the whole world is crashing in on us. And all that we can see is how are we going to get through the next day? What is all of this for? What is the purpose of all of this? We've all asked questions like Solomon has asked. But the thing that I love about chapter 3 is that Solomon finally starts to answer those questions in real ways that have real impact. So let's jump into this. Um, as we start off in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verses 1 through 8, this is definitely uh, the most well-known probably passage from Ecclesiastes. So even if you didn't really know anything about Ecclesiastes before, you've probably heard this set of passages. So let's jump in through one through eight. For everything, there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, 
a time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to seek and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to cast away, a time to tear and a time to sow, a time to keep silent and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. Anybody heard those before? Even if you weren't like familiar with Ecclesiastes, if you grew up in the 70s, you might have heard the number one, right? The birds turn, 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 right? So, I mean, it was, it's a very popular passage of scripture going through. Um, but I think Solomon is trying to convey a message to us here. See, whenever we read through all of these different things, we'd like to think that we get to choose the times. We like to think that we are the ones who have control over the time as we start to read through these, right? Like, oh, well, I get to decide when the time to love and when the time to hate and the time for peace and the time for war, that we're the ones who have control ultimately over these things. And in our lives, so many times, we try to order them and control them and set them all up. Do we have any control freaks in the house? It's okay. I know you're out there. You know, okay, we got one. Yes. See, there you go. So I know that we have more than that in this place that you feel like you have to order and control everything. But as we go through this, it's interesting that Solomon begins these pairs with, there is a time to be born and a time to die. Anybody choose their birthday? Like, mom, listen, I know that I'm scheduled to come out at this, but really, can we push it back a couple of weeks? It's really not great for my schedule. Like, none of us chose those things. None of us chose whenever we were going to be born. And ultimately, you can eat all the kale that you want. You can exercise. You can go and run marathons. You can do all of the things. But ultimately, the day of our death is coming. And very few of us will expect when it comes. One commentator wrote that humans rarely discover the times. Instead, times discover them, and they come upon us when we least expect them. And so as we open up this chapter of Ecclesiastes, we begin to see that control is an illusion, right? Solomon is writing, and he's saying, under the sun, control is an illusion. Everything happens. The tides continue to roll. The rains continue to fall. If you're in Oklahoma, they fall and they fall and they fall and they fall, right, over and over again. And all of these things just kind of happen, and you don't really have control over them, right? I mean, even the things in this list that we would like to say we have control over, right, a time to speak and a time to be silent. Husbands, any of you get that right all the time? I'll ask your wife, so don't lie to me, right? So even the things that we seem to have control over, that we like to think, that we can control, it seems like the timing is always just a little off. It seems like events in life sometimes just continue to roll and they happen. And with all of the energy and the willpower that we exert on them, just continues to go, continues to flow by. Solomon is telling us here that control is an illusion. And under the sun, this can be a very depressing thing. Because I know that even though we only had one guy raise your hand, thank you for being honest, sir, that even though we only had one person raise your hand, a lot of us have issues with control, right? A lot of us stay up at night wondering how we're going to fix situations, wondering how we're going to do this or that, wondering how all of these things are going to work out. We stay up in anxiety and in frustration, and, and we understand this, that it just feels like as much as we try, we have no control. And Solomon, in all of his wealth, in all of his wisdom, in all of his kingly authority, is saying, time's just going to happen. No matter how powerful you are, it's just going to happen. And we don't really have that much control. Control is an illusion. The next thing under the sun that Solomon says here is that injustices are inevitable. So here in 3, 16 through 17, we read, Moreover, I saw under the sun that in the place of justice, there was wickedness. And in the place of righteousness, even there was wickedness. And I said in my heart, God will judge the righteous and the wicked, for there is a time and a matter for every work. 
And then we go to uh, chapter four, verses one through three. And he says, and again, I saw all of the oppressions that are done under the sun. And behold, the tears of the oppressed, and they had no one to comfort them. And on the side of their oppressors, there was power, and there was no one to comfort them. And I thought the dead who are already dead, more fortunate than the living who are still alive. But better than both is he who is yet to be born and has not seen the evil deeds that are done under the sun. Now you want to talk about depressing, right? Whenever we read this, it's like, oh. And it's even, I think, a little bit more whenever you realize who Solomon was, right? That he's saying, man, injustice has just happened. Oppression just happens. And you really can't do anything about it. And you think if there's one person who could do something about injustices and oppression in a kingdom, probably be the king, right? And yet Solomon is here as the king of Israel, the the wealthiest. Literally, whenever it talks about Solomon's wealth, it says that they would just stack up piles of silver because it was like as nothing in his kingdom. That's how wealthy he was. So you want to talk about like Jeff Bezos? Nothing compared to Solomon. Like he had all of the resources to be able to enact and affect whatever policies he wanted to. You want to talk about authority? It wasn't like he had a board of elders like our church has, right? He didn't have a parliament. He didn't have a Congress that he had to get things passed through. He had himself. He could basically enact whatever laws he wanted to enact. And yet he said, even with all of this power and all of this money, I feel like oppressions are still going to happen. I feel like injustices are still going to happen. I feel like there's always going to be a, a power imbalance. There's always going to be the haves and the have-nots, and they're always going to be struggling. Sorry, struggling and fighting against each other. I'm not even, I didn't even go to camp this week, Matt. I don't know what's wrong with that. They're always going to be struggling and fighting. And is there really anything you can do about it under the sun? And then we come to the next one. And maybe this one is the one that we will all connect with the most. Death is inescapable. So chapter three, verses 18 through 22. I said... In my heart, with regard to the children of man, God is testing them that they may see that they themselves are but beasts. For what happens to the children of man and what happens to the beasts is the same. One dies, so dies the other. They have the same breath, and man has no advantage over the beast, for all is vanity. All go to one place, all are from dust, and all to dust return. Who knows whether the spirit of man goes upward and the spirit of beasts goes down into the earth. So I saw that there is nothing better than that a man should rejoice in his work, for this is his lot. Who can bring him to see what will be after him? Right? Doesn't sometimes who lives and who dies seem so random? I know in my own life, my older brother, he never made it to 25, was killed at a party, but my Great-grandmother lived to be 103 years old, even though the last 10 years of her life, she ate cheeseburgers every single day of her life, and she dipped tobacco from the time she was 20 until the time she was 103. She wasn't following the Atkins diet, okay? So, I mean, she wasn't on some health regimen, and yet she lived to be 103. And then you look at other people who seem to be at the prime of their life that are cut down by things that are seemingly hevel, purposeless. Like, what was, the, what was the meaning of everything that just happened? I mean, think about Solomon as he writes this, right? So he has a unique perspective on this because Solomon's father was King David, right? So if you read in the Bible about King David, you're going to see that he is a monumental figure. Whenever he was just a young boy, he would sleep out in the open country, would literally fight lions and bears, saying that he would grab them by the jaw whenever they would come by to take his sheep. Pretty impressive, right? And then as he got older, he killed this dude named Goliath, kind of a big dude, right? Kind of a big deal. Whenever he was uh, even just a young man, they sang songs about him saying he has slain his tens of thousands. As he progressed, he began to lead a band of men that were called David's mighty men. Okay, so let me just give you uh, an example of one of these guys. So one of these guys that uh, that David led, he was walking by... uh, just this random hole on a snowy day. There was a big hole in the ground and there was a lion down there. And this guy said, hey, I think I'm going to get down there and kill that lion with my bare hands. 
Not normal people that we're talking about here, okay? So these are the kind of men that David is leading with just his words alone. You're talking about kingdoms and kings cowering at just the name of King David and his armies. And yet, we read in Scripture that at the end of King David's life, he's laying in a kingly bed, piled up with blankets, shivering, unable to get warmth into his bones. This larger-than-life figure, without the strength to even lift himself, much less a sword. And Solomon says, death is inevitable. It doesn't matter how strong you are. It doesn't matter if you're drinking that acai berry stuff. It, it doesn't matter what you're doing. It's, it's going to happen. And if we left it there, we would leave a very depressed people. But the thing that I love about chapter 3 is that Solomon brings in a new word that we haven't yet seen in Ecclesiastes. And so as we go down here, what we see is that in chapter 3, verse 11, he brings in this idea of eternity. Eternity. Something that's durable, something that lasts, something that is beyond the vapor and the mist and the seeming nothingness that he's been talking about. Hevel, hevel, hevel. 38 times he uses it. And here he brings in this new word. He says, eternity. Literally everlasting, perpetual. Chapter 3, verse 11 says, He has made everything beautiful in his time, and he has also put eternity into man's heart, yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. I think what this means is that what is around us is iridescent with the traces of eternity that God has created the world and everything in it so that if we would just take a step back, we would realize that there is something more than just this moment. And it's not just me who believes this. So if you look at, um, how many of you have heard of a, a scientist, Carl Sagan? You ever heard of him, right? So he's definitely a naturalist, you know, believes completely in um, basically that uh, everything started from nothing. Everything means nothing. Everything evolved out of nothing, and everything will eventually become nothing. So, Ecclesiastes. So that's kind of what he's, what he's believing there as he's going through. That's Carl Sagan's kind of worldview, but he has this really interesting quote, and it's one of his most famous quotes. He says, The cosmos is within us. We are made of star stuff. We are a way for the universe to know itself. Now, that doesn't sound like nothing from nothing on its way to nothing. That sounds like he's, he's trying to recognize that there's something resonating inside of him that says that there is something more than just today. There is something more than all of this nothingness that we've been talking about, the universe reflecting itself. And while that might just be rhetoric, it is his recognition that there's something out there more than just today. Even those vehemently opposed to God can see eternity. A man named Francis S. Collins, some of you might be familiar with him. He was the lead researcher on the Human Genome Project. And he was much the same as Carl Sagan. He was a naturalist. He was a believer that um, everything came from nothing, that evolution and naturalism explained all of the world around us. And yet, as he was sequencing the genome, as he was going through and seeing the complexity of a single strand of DNA, he realized that this couldn't be come by chance, that there had to be something greater out there. This wasn't a one in 10 to the billionth chance that all of these things came together, but there was something beyond. He wrote a book called The Language of God, where he explains his experience of, of conversion through seeing the beauty of God in nature. And we don't have to be a world-renowned scientist to be able to see this. If any of you have ever taken a moment and sat on the beach and watched the waves crash against the shore, it just makes something inside of you feel like there's something more than just today. If you've ever gone to the top of a mountain and looked out, there's something inside of you that makes you start asking those questions of, is there more than just what is going on here? Eternity. 
is iridescent in creation. And scripture tells us this. Psalm chapter 19, verse 1 starts with, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiworks. Day to day pours out speech. Night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. All of creation is luminous with the fact that there is something more than just today. And Solomon brings this out. And he says, all of these things, hevel, hevel, hevel. And this word here that he uses in the Hebrew is olom, everlasting. And now he's contrasting. He's saying everything seems so meaningless, but inside each person, God has placed eternity. He has placed olom. He has placed something everlasting that we would see beyond just today. And he says, but so that they cannot see what God has done from the beginning to the end. And I think what that means is that we get so caught up in what is around us that all we can see is what's under the sun. And if we could just get a little bit of perspective over the sun, we'd begin to see that nothing matters except for everything. We begin to see that all of these things that just seem so completely and totally random, they actually have purpose. They actually have meaning that somebody giving a book to somebody who just wanted to argue, someone who only went over there to debate with them, and they gave them a Bible. And that might seem like a small act, and yet that small act echoed because then he became a believer, and that means that my mom was raised as a believer, and that means that my father, whenever she married him, and he was as heathen as they come, Because of her faithful prayers, he became a believer. And that means that I was raised in a household where I knew Jesus from a very young age. And that means that whenever I grow older and we have children, that they will be raised in a household where they know who Christ is because of one small act. And if we're in the middle of it, it seems so insignificant. Right? I mean, a Bible is everywhere. You open at a hotel room. There's a Gideon Bible there, right? You probably have 47 at your house right now. I mean, just like, is it really, does it really matter? And yet, it does. And it can have an impact that goes on to eternity. So I I brought this little illustration here. And uh, just so you know, pastors are thieves, so um, I stole this illustration. So that's just the way it is, but... So if you look at this, this little area here that I have taped, okay, think of this as all of human history. All of human history, right? And so now what Solomon said throughout this book is like, you look at human history from the beginning to now. So you look over here from Adam to where we're at right now, all of the things that have gone on, right? And, and he's saying, what's the purpose? Find yourself on this timeline. Do you see where you're at? In all of human history? No, you're a blip. But the amazing thing is now he's saying, but we have eternity in our hearts. And what he's saying is that right here, in this little tiny place that you can't even see where your life is, what you do there will echo into eternity. That the things that we do here are not meaningless, but instead after the first million years of singing holy, 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 after falling down on our face and saying great is our God, after all, it continues to go on and on and on and on. That what we do here has impact that echoes into eternity. Eternity is iridescent in the world around us. And the problem is we get so caught up in the day-to-day right? Every single one of us we do because you have deadlines and you have a boss that can be frustrating or you are a boss that is frustrating or you have, just saying, or you have kids that have ball practice and it's ball practice and it's ballet practice and it's piano practice and you're doing all these things and then you're trying to find time for your hobbies so that you don't go crazy and you're trying to make time for your wife and you're trying to do all these different things and if we're not careful We get into those rhythms and those patterns of the day to day to day to day. And we ask ourselves the same question that Solomon asked. Does any of it matter? 
But if we just get a little bit of perspective, if we listen to what the Spirit is telling us, if we read the Word of God and we see the beauties that are contained, then we start to realize that it does matter, that it has purpose, that everything that we do has purpose. And Solomon says as much here. It's his second time to use the, the same word, olom, and it's in uh, chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. I perceived that whatever God does endures forever. Nothing can be added to it, nor anything taken away from it. God has done it so that the people fear him. That which is already, that no, sorry, that which is already has been, and that which is to be already has been, and God seeks what has been driven away. So we read here this thesis, which says, I perceived that whatever God does endures forever. So the question is, what has God done? Right? It's a valid question. If he says everything that God's done endures forever. So the question that we have to ask is, well, what has God done? Well, so let's just start a list. So he created the universe, right? By the word of his mouth. He breathed out the stars, Right, So he created every human being, so he formed us, he gave us purpose, he has set the boundaries of nations and oceans and rulers and authorities. He says that he has guided the hearts of rulers like a river in his hand. So let's just say pretty much everything. So all throughout the book of Ecclesiastes, what we're reading is Hevel. Hevel, everything is hevel. It, it's vapor. There's nothing solid. It's, it, it's vanity. It's trying to chase after the wind. It's except for what God has done. And so everything doesn't matter except for everything. Because whenever we add God into the equation, whenever we, we stop looking at just the day to day and we realize that God has a grand purpose and a plan for our world and for our lives, then we start to realize that our day to day is not just a day to day, but what we do today will affect eternity. That what we do today has impact that goes beyond our lives. We have impact that goes beyond our families. We have impact that passes generations. Because of what we do today. And my friends, that is not meaningless. That is not vapor. That is alone. That is eternity. That is everlasting. That has something that goes beyond ourselves. So we have to ask the question, what are we doing to impact eternity? Are we thinking about eternity with our lives? Because it's nice to think sometimes that, well, some things I do will impact eternity and some things I do won't impact eternity. But the truth is that everything you do will have an impact on eternity one way or the other. Our actions and our apathy, our words and our silence, our times of love, our words of correction and our words of hatred, Every one of those will affect eternity in some way or another. So let's just put it this way. I'm holding a Bible here. And like I said, I don't know anything about the man who gave this to my grandfather. Know his last name? Think I might know what he did, and I know that he gave him a Bible. And I stand here partially due to the fact that that was an eternal act. And one day, should the Lord tarry and the Lord will, hopefully I'll be able to pass this down to my children. I'll pass it down to their children. But let me tell you that long after this Bible has dissolved and its pages have become dust and its leather is cracked and filling up a landfill somewhere, long after that, the impact of that one action will continue on. I can't tell you how timely it was that John gave his testimony today and, and, and explained that. I was just like, it's like the Holy Spirit knew what he was doing whenever he brought this guy up here. Because I, I, like I said, I don't know John or his testimony or what he was going to say today, but um, it's true. And he said it whenever he was in the midst of it, in the midst of that struggle, in the trenches, just feeling like he was getting hit from every side. 
people came around him and they helped him have an eternal perspective. And they showed him that all of these things were not meaningless, but meaningful. And so we have to evaluate in our own lives what impact are my actions having. And I think we have to do this in two ways. We have to do this both as individuals and as a church. We have to say what impact are our actions having. So um, for those out there, whenever, you know, we laughed at it when it said bad bosses and maybe you are a bad boss, like we, we, we don't, do we think about that? Do we separate our work life from our Christian devotion? If somebody were to come to church and see us, would they be surprised at who we say we are? Would our employees think of us the same as the person sitting in the pew next to you thinks of us? And if not, what impact is that having on their eternity? As we walk through these things, we, we have to ask ourselves the hard questions. What impact am I having? And we have to ask ourselves the question as a church, too. And I, I wish I could say that churches were immune from this, you know, but uh, I think we all know that they're not. I'm just sharing a story. So I was at a church before in New Mexico. That's where uh, my wife and I moved from. We moved from New Mexico. And at this church one day, the, uh, the worship pastor got called into the pastor's office and kind of got called onto the carpet, and he got read the riot act. I mean, just about how he had messed up so bad and that there was policies in place specifically to prevent this. And what he got called into the office for was because he had moved the 1980s silk plants that sat on the stage. Like, I'm serious. This is an actual, like, real story that, like, there were these silk plants that sat on the stage. And he didn't even move them off the stage. He, he moved them out of the way so there would be more room for the worship team. And he got it, right? And the crazy thing was there was policies. Literally, the trustees committee had written policies about not moving the silk plants. That's insane, and I wish I could say that that was a made-up story, but it's not. And I wish I could say that churches were immune from this kind of silliness, but we're not. And I wish I could say that that's not really going to have an impact on eternity, but I think it will. Whenever our churches and whenever we uh, as people come together and we squabble over preferences and we exalt that above our purpose, that has an impact on a watching world around us on a world that is desperately in need of Jesus Christ, and yet we find ways to bicker over everything from the color of the carpet to the silk plants on the stage to the style of worship. And we exalt our preferences above our purpose, and it has an eternal impact. So as we look, as we think, as we believe that what Scripture says is true, because remember that this isn't just being written by a depressed king. This is being written by a man that the Bible describes as being guided and pushed along and drawn by the Holy Spirit as he writes these words, because this is Scripture. And so this is not some strange view of how the world works. This is how the world actually works that if we're not careful, everything seems meaningless. If we're not careful, we think that our actions and that the way that we live our lives on the day-to-day -day are maybe a little bit important, but really at the end of the day don't have that much impact. And yet what Solomon and the Holy Spirit are telling us is that what we do here in this little short period of time, the things that we do, don't stay here, but they continue on and on. So the question is, Christian, church member, metropolitan, what are we doing? Bob Rowley, I don't know if you know him or not, he's uh, the district superintendent for the EFCA, and um, we're currently working with him um, to hopefully one day be able to plant a church. That's our, our goal, and that's why we're here. And he asks uh, pastors two questions every time he meets with them. He says, what's your business, 
and how's business? So today I would ask that question, what's our business, church? What is the purpose that God has placed us on this earth for? Because it is more than just to occupy pews. It is more than just to sing songs. It is more than just to come together with people that we really like. It is more than just to be excellent at live streaming. It is more than all of that. Scripture tells us that the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. And if our purpose is anything other than seeking and saving the lost, then what are we really doing? Because I promise you that it is not just the good things that we do or the faithful things that we do that will echo into eternity. It is everything we do that will echo into eternity Nothing matters except for everything. And this should give us two firm convictions. The first conviction, thank God that he is gracious and sovereign and loving and good because we all fail in many ways, every single one of us, and we're never going to get it perfect no matter how much wisdom or how much money or how much position we have, we are all going to fail in these areas. And thank God that he is gracious, that he is the one who is sovereign, that even though it seems under the sun, control is an illusion. That is a lie because there is control. It's just not ours. It belongs to our sovereign, good God. And he is completely in control. And there is nothing that happens outside of his hands. Control is not an illusion. It is very real. But it is completely the prerogative of God. And I'm so glad. And I hope that you have that assurance that that is the God who loves us, who has ransomed us, who has saved us, who is rich in mercy, full of steadfast love, and the things that he does will endure forever. And it should give us another firm conviction, and that is that it should give us an urgency for the gospel. Because so many times we just feel like, oh yeah, we we go back and forth between life is short and I've got all the time in the world. Any procrastinators out there, go talk to the control freaks, right? Because you'll drive them crazy, right? (laughs) So, But sometimes we're just like, I've got all the time in the world. Or we act like we do. I'll do that whenever the kids are out of the house. I'll do that as soon as I get to retirement age. I'll do that as soon as we get X amount in the bank account. I'll do that as soon as I take care of all of these other things. Or once I get out of this season, you know, somebody said that being an adult just means, yeah, in this next season, things are going to slow down and they won't be quite so busy until you die. I mean, because that's just the truth. Like we always say, like, right, things are going to slow down next week. Things are going to slow down in a month. Things are... But do they ever really slow down? I mean, if Ecclesiastes has taught us anything, it just rolls right on by, and before you know it, you're out of time. So it should give us an urgency that there is no time like today to affect eternity. There is no time like today to preach the only gospel that can save. Because, friends, as hard as it is for us to hear sometimes, it's not only Christians who live forever. It's not only those who love God who live forever. There is an eternity, but there's more than one destination. And it is our responsibility to preach the only message that can save today. To love those who are hurting today. To right the wrongs that are within our power to right today to spend and be spent for the cause of Christ today. Because tomorrow is not promised and eternity is on the line. So what matters? Nothing except for everything. And what we do today will affect someone's eternity. Whether it be your children, your neighbor, the random stranger. So I pray that this eternity that God has put into our hearts
by fellowshipping with one another and keeping our eyes on him will guide us to the knowledge. Lord, remind us that this life is short. Remind us that even though the things of this world consistently bombard us and and seek and vie for our attention, that where you would have us to look is to your Son. And Jesus, you said that if you be lifted up from the earth, you would draw all men to yourself. Seeking and saving the lost. And so we ask, Lord, that you would remind us of this glorious purpose, that we were made for more than to be born Get a job, pay taxes, and to die. We were born for eternity. And what we do today will have impact far beyond that which we can imagine. And so we thank you, Lord, that you are the sovereign God who holds eternity in your hands, that everything you do will endure forever. And so do it through us. Do it through us as as individuals, as families. Do it through us as a church that we would have an eternal impact for your kingdom on our city and on our world. So give us a perspective that is over the sun. In the name of your son, we pray. Amen.